Hello, this is Marvin McKenzie with uh, lecture number two in my patriotic anecdote series. Um, this was a series of this is a series of little anecdotes and stories that I've been using in my sermons this last year. Wanted to separate them out and give you the lesson. So, though the great majority of people who moved from Europe to this continent in the 1600s did so fleeing religious oppression and hoping for the freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Each of them came to this new chart land to charter a government authorized by England, and each of them prided themselves in being English free men. The fact was, they were not so as free as they imagined. Each colony, except Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, forced the inhabitants to worship God according to the dictates of their own charter, and there was very much persecution of those dwelling in those colonies who worshipped some way other than the charter allowed. Baptists were persecuted from Massachusetts all the way down to South Carolina. Baptists were never free from uh, free men on this continent until after the signing of the Bill of Rights. But the majority of the inhabitants of the colonies considered themselves English free men, and the English prided themselves on being free men. Now you have to consider that those in American colonies uh, fought to be thought of on equal footing as their brothers and sisters in England. They were citizens of England, but they were like uh, stepchildren or half-brothers and sisters. They were English free men just on a lower scale, and they longed to be respected by England. They loved England. They were proud to be English. They revered everything that was English, but like a boy who reveres his father and would do anything to make him proud, only to discover that there's nothing he can do to make his father proud, English free men in America could, in the eyes of national Englishmen, never measure up to the true British standards. They loved their king, they loved their parliament, they loved their system of government, because as they understood it, they always had the right to um, take any grievances they might have uh, with their government directly to the parliament or to the king, depending upon the circumstances. They came, then came a series of taxes placed upon the American-produced goods, Taxes the Americans felt were unfairly charged upon them. England was at war with France, and it was costing them a fortune. Plus, England had had to bring troops to America to fight off the Indians during the French and Indian War, and that had been, that had been no small expense. So in England's mind, the Americans ought to pay for it. Now, everything was probably okay at this point. The Americans were unhappy about the taxes, and they were sent diplomats, diplomats to England to do exactly what they have always believed was their right to do, and that was to address their grievances and have them fairly considered. Well, that's not what happened. They were, in their own opinion, snubbed as second-class citizens before the English Parliament. At this point, they do what they have also believed was their right to do as English free men. They protested. The protest turned ugly and shots were fired. People died. So they took the next step of an English free man. They raised a militia. It was at this point the lights began to turn on and the thought came to their minds, our liberty has been lost. March 23rd, 1775, Patrick Henry stood and delivered his famous give me liberty or give me death speech, the last part of which said, they tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary, but when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies have bound us and uh, hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to, re to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. 
The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is what is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death.